And welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. <laughs> and I am Christmas Tree Crypto. Ooh, that's pretty good. I like that. It, you've got more alliteration, but I'm actually the one with the Christmas tree over here. Uh, so. I don't have any Christmas decorations left. We get rid of all of them when we move. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we go heavy into the literature that we read. Today we are covering A Christmas Tree and a Wedding by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And as always, we start off with publication information. This story was published in 1848, and our version was translated by Constance Garnett. And I will start with the trigger warning that this is not your Hallmark Christmas story. (laughs) There will be no Santa, no cookies, no elves, no happy ending whatsoever. Well, you could have assumed that by the fact that we are celebrating a Russian Christmas. I would have guessed that this was not happy endings. But this does involve the predation of a young girl, so I would be aware of that going into it. One thing to note here is to point out about our author Dostoevsky was born to lower class parents in 1821 and we think that that plays a big role in his writing and what he writes about especially the different class systems at Russia in this time and he's going to bring that into his Christmas story. So why are we talking about Christmas stories? We are doing a very foreign Christmas along with our friend Christy Lewis over at Dostoevsky in Space. Probably very excited to do more Dostoevsky. The idea was let's broaden our horizon and see how other cultures possibly experience this time of year. We go through all the usual Christmas stories every single year. Maybe we can spend some time kind of seeing maybe how other cultures view it. Yeah, I know personally that we've talked about before that Christmas is something that we've Americanized and we have Coca-Cola and the red shiny coat of Santa and all our stories on the Hallmark Channel are about, you know, hope and giving and they give you these good, warm, fuzzy feelings and there's always a happy ending. But in many of the cultures around the world, that's not the case for Christmas. It has a different tire meaning for them. You know, we're used to the greedy self-interested person, Scrooge, Grinch, who revel in the misery of others. The idea of hurting others and also increasing your own status in a sense. Now, the difference though is you see this moment of epiphany <laughs> where <laughs> where Scrooge or where Grinch see what most people would call universally universally wrong things to do of, of hurting other people. They see the light and turn around and, and kind of have this moment. It seems to me like what we're experiencing here is Dostoevsky is almost kind of acknowledging that Scrooges and Grinches do exist. Yeah, but the big difference here is that a lot of times it's a redemption story in the westernized versions of these stories where they realize that greed and all this is bad and that they have a a turn of heart, a change of heart, heart grows three times is too big. In this story, we're not going to see that. The the quote, that guy wins, so to speak. Well, Well, and that twist, right, the epiphany, all the this character's done all these bad things. So so how do you purge the bad feelings? It's that that revelation and then the giving that allows them to purge out their bad acts from an from an audience standpoint. It feels much different in a story where we're just acknowledging that this is part of our society. Uh, we're calling out a problem, but then there's no fantasy solution, I guess, in a sense. Yeah, and our main character in A Christmas Tree and a Wedding is very cold and detached and never gets that warmth that we see in A, a Christmas Carol or, you know, How a Grinch Stole Christmas. The, the Lindy Lou here doesn't have her happy ending. <laughs> she I, gets I a wedding dress. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't, I really don't know much about Russian weddings in particular ages, but this, <laughs> as, as, you know, an American looking at this, 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 I, I got some chills in a sense of just like Ugh. like like it didn't feel it didn't feel good From our perspective you know in 2020 gives you the heebie-jeebies a little bit so yeah. hit us with the plot so they kind of know what we're talking about all right so the narrator tells us how he, he sees a wedding and oh my gosh it reminds me of this event five years ago i gotta tell you about this event right it's more and, important than the wedding <laughs> <laughs> you ever have a friend that does that like oh, i yeah. gotta tell you something but first i gotta tell you about this other thing oh my gosh and there are also those friends that you can't get a word in edgewise typically right so Wait a the, minute, is that me? <laughs> <laughs> the narrator was invited to a children's party five years prior. He recalls seeing poor individuals being ignored, as well as an honored and wealthy guest, Yulian Mastakovich, who was pampered as well. 
The narrator then heads to a parlor where he sees a small girl whose feelings has been hurt by other children. The girl has come from wealth and has a $300,000 dowry. She has received the costliest doll as a present compared to the other children. Later, a lower class boy who was shunned from playing with others, couldn't play with all the other reindeers, right? Went to the parlor <laughs> to play with a wealthy girl. And soon, Yulian enters the parlor. Ba, ba, ba. The narrator watches as Yulian schemed and calculated the number of years until the, until the 11-year-old girl with a large dowry could be wedded. Creepy. Yulian attempted to speak to the young and wealthy girl alone and attempted to have the young boy leave the room to leave them alone. The girl was hesitant and bothered by Yulian, and soon they are interrupted and Yulian goes to entertain specifically that little girl's parents at the party. Cutting back to the present, the narrator's walking outside a church. He spots a wedding where he recognizes the groom as Yulian and the young wealthy girl from five years ago party leaving the church together announced as newlyweds the narrator was shocked and remarked how yulian's calculations must have been correct as he announced the girl's dowry to be nearing five hundred thousand. end plot so our twist here is not the happy one that we wanted. We're like, oh, man, he pulled the rug underneath us here. <laughs> wow. I was not no. expecting that at all when I read this. No, that's, And it didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> that's, that's Russia. Let's go to the deepest, darkest place. And then we're going to go even deeper and darker after that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you thought that was pitch black? Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> well, put a, put a pin in that. We need to talk about that one later on. But first, we need to hit the main topic of, of social status, right? So a lot of Christmas tales, favorite themes is social status. Even with Ebenezer Scrooge, right? He was higher class, stole, took from, the, took from advantage of his fellow man without ever thought of giving back heavy Christian ideals in that. Dostoevsky, very Christian as well. Does he paint Yulian in this picture in a good light? No, you can tell from the story the way he describes him being very rotund and, you know, having him, you know, you know, basically uh, creep on this little girl here. He He's portraying that this higher individual is lording over these lower classes and that, that she is the only one that's worthy of his time. The one that has money. Yulian stood in the same relation to our host as our host stood in relation to the gentleman who was stroking his whiskers. So the whiskers gentleman was lower class, right? Nobody wanted anything to do with him. So here we are at a Christmas, was it no, New Year's party, New Year's Eve party? At a party. Well, let's say that. And everybody, instead of socializing, mingling, having fun, Dostoevsky is painting the picture of everyone being greedy in the sense of trying to climb the social status ladder. Whoever was higher in rank is who they were trying to talk to, and Yulian being the highest is who everyone paid respect to, and the guy with the whiskers, nobody wanted anything to do with, because he couldn't give anyone anything because he was low class, right? Yeah, exactly. These adults are doing the opposite of what they ought to be doing at a end-of-the-year party, and instead... Focusing on greed, focusing on self-interested items. Something new and why we want to read these stories is because you would think at this point there would be some twist through the story where people would learn about this and think, oh, there's more than advancing up in rank or becoming more popular or powerful or rich. And that doesn't happen in this story. And so that's something of note. And we go darker, right? So not only yep. are the parents doing this, right? So then we see the little girl get the wealthiest, most expensive doll, I should say. And, okay, so, so that's one thing is she's automatically bought into class rich beginning rich, right? And then you have that other little boy. And remember, he wanted to, like, play with others. He wanted this theater thing. And, and, and they weren't having it, right? He didn't have the tools as, as getting the poor gift. He didn't have the tools to barter to live a better life. This is Dostoevsky almost painting further that not only do people try to climb the ladder, they can't. This little boy who doesn't have the resources and toys upon which to barter for a higher class, a higher, a play, you know, playing with other boys that he couldn't currently, can't. And this little girl is, she's got the most expensive gift, but how does she feel? She's sad. Yeah. I think it's interesting that they're getting gifts, but getting something isn't the point here, like we see in other cultures, where these gifts represent a status. They don't care that they got something. It's what they got. And that's another 
teachable thing through Christmas is that you should be, you know, thankful for whatever you get. You got at least something, and that's not good enough for these people. And I think that leads us into kind of the foreshadowing of why the presents are very different in this story than a lot of other westernized stories. And to your point, the adults in reinforce that too, right? Like Julian, when he walks up to the child, asks her, dear child, what do you know what your dolly is made of? I don't know. The girl answered in a whisper, hanging her head. It's made of rags, darling. So here he is reinforcing, you know, even though it's the most costly, you should just know that it's just rags. It's not, you know, it's not actually a, a valuable thing in a sense. Yeah, so it's not the actual gift that matters. And we're seeing this... Um unequal distribution of wealth between the different groups and he's like ugh, that's nothing compared when ripped away or in serious danger we throw away those things to things that truly matter right and when yeah we would hope so well when julian tries to kind of wrestle the girl away you have that quote the boy and girl frowned and clutched at each other they did not want to be separated so here normally the higher class and the lower class couldn't couldn't play together here you have dostoevsky kind of representing that there is a very the a very small glimmer of hope maybe a russian glimmer of hope maybe yeah well i think what he's trying to do is say here is that the lower classes will always come together to try to thwart the upper classes that are trying to oppress them even though they look different upon each other when it's them versus the upper they're gonna always pick together over trying to go against them individually all right so let's snap back to the present day wedding the girl was described as pale and melancholy and her past almost mutely begging for help yeah i think this is another thing for russian culture where you see that the young girl was obviously forced into this wedding this is an arranged marriage because of finances and status I think this is also almost callback to that little boy who couldn't bargain his way out of his social class status. The, the, the way that we know Dostoevsky loves to write about social classes, right? Here's the girl who's unhappy. She was unhappy. The present wasn't able to buy her happiness. Here she is being married off as like a a prize to be won, to quote Jasmine from Aladdin, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, that's what the dowry is, right? Is it's it's the it's the wealth passing on to the wealth to be able to keep those social circles closed, keeping upper class as upper class. Not a uniquely Russian idea, but we definitely see it being represented here, even within the Russian culture of the story. Yeah, and a Christmas story to boot on top of to it. me, this is even wealth over individualism or happiness. Yeah, exactly. This is confirming that Scrooges exist in the real world, and nobody likes him as the person. They just like his class or his money. Well, when we look at our Scrooge story, what we love is the hero, the guy that that he pulled himself out of this this situation. The individualism of of I made this decision. Now, what we get with this story is we have someone trying to break out of class and they can't. They're stuck there. You have Russia is much more collectivism. It's much more we accomplished this. We did this. Instead of I pulled myself up, it's we push ourselves up. And I think what you have is Dostoevsky kind of satirizing a little bit of that element in this story where we have individuals unable to break out. It has to be a we thing in order to change the system. Yeah, Russia has been kind of known for that. I mean, this is obviously 70 years before communism, but still that identity, uh, that Russian we-ness is still very prevalent in the mid-19th century. It was Russia was a battlefield, not just literally in terms of people and blood, but in terms of ideologies too. Sure, yeah, because the rest of the world is industrializing, capitalize, capitalism is taking over in in Germany and in Great Britain and the United States, and Russia does not want to follow suit in that. They want to stay agricultural. They want to stay the way that they are in their own terms, and this story kind of represents that uh, societal divide or weeness again together. Yeah, which which I think is... You could only get that from a Russian author, right? We, we as an American audience or Western audience for that matter, in our priority on individualism are like, why didn't the little girl just do something different? It's like, you, we must really listen to the pressures these people are facing, what this girl was facing to really understand their situation, I feel like. 
Yep. You don't get a choice in the matter. And from our viewpoint in 2020, it's hard to realize that been given all of these freedoms. So I know some people enjoy these conversations, but aren't sure what comment to leave down below. Please feel free to leave a Christmas tree emoji to help us out. We will leave a Dostoevsky specific playlist down below if you'd like to hear us talk about more Dostoevsky stories and novels from him. Let's move into our subjective ratings. Crypto, what are you going to give this one? So two very polarizing, I think, <laughs> yeah, numbers yeah. on this one uh, for enjoyment. I think with the kind of trigger of that you have creepy old guy, young girl does not vibe well with me. Yeah. Uh, Going to give this like a three, two or three, very low for enjoyment. But analytically, it's very rich for understanding Russian culture in the mid 19th century and that political uh, or excuse me for that class divide. Uh, so maybe like an eight, eight and a half up there. So I guess when you add those together, I'm at like a five overall, two and an eight somewhere in there. So kind of split it down the middle. You changed it. You were a three and eight earlier. Are you three or you two? Okay, I'll go. I'll go three and eight. Three and eight. So okay. give me a five and a half, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I, I would actually. I am remarkably similar to you, where I just did not have good feelings from the story. It just wasn't for me. Didn't didn't really vibe with me. So probably like a two on a personal enjoyment scale. But in terms of analytics, I, I completely agree that there is actually a lot of good stuff here. Very typical Dostoevsky, you know, class discussion, individualism, collectivism. Ah, just really good. Really good story. I'll go. I'll get. I'll give it an eight. I'll do the two and the eight. So I'll give it a a, a, a five. ten. A five. <laughs> you a gave five. it a ten. <laughs> I give it a five. Average, okay, fair average. enough. So, fair enough. So definitely not one of my favorite stories, but I have no regrets reading and at least having experienced. I feel like more of a different culture's view on this time of year. Go ahead and check out the very Russian Christmas stories. Thank you guys so much for listening and checking out our conversation today. Please feel free to subscribe. We post videos every Monday and Thursday. Una out. Peace.